My name is Sarah Costello. I'm Assistant Professor of Art History at the University of Houston, Clear Lake. This compelling figure is a highlight of the ancient Mediterranean holdings at the Manil Collection, a museum in Houston, Texas. My interest in this object dates back to my arrival in Houston in 2002, when I first came face to face with the figure. Since that time, my engagement with the museum has changed and developed, from a member of the interested public, to an educator bringing students in to do object research, to my recent role as part of a research collaborative. In my talk today, I will discuss my changing engagement with this collection and with this object. I will also share a synopsis of the object biography I am creating and how that work relates to my larger goals in collaborating with the Manil Collection. The Manil Collection's ancient Mediterranean holdings number around 500 objects. They were acquisitions of John and Dominique de Manil, mainly in the third quarter of the 20th century, with 68% of the objects accessioned prior to 1970. The galleries were installed in 1987, largely by Dominique de Manil herself, and have been little changed and the collection little investigated in the years since. In the 2012 ASOR session on secondary contexts, I used the Manil Collection's Cycladic objects as examples of pieces lacking in provenience and labeled ambiguously. I argued that trying to gain information from unprovenienced and presumably looted objects was a conciliatory approach that had resulted in so many concessions that the looting of objects was proceeding undeterred. I proposed that museums should be transparent about unprovenienced objects that are already in their collections and that they stop displaying such pieces with vaguely authoritative labels. About a year later, the opportunity to put those ideas into action arose. My colleague at Rice University, John Hopkins, and I met with the new curator of collections at the Manil, Paul Davis, and discussed the possibility of developing a collaborative research project to investigate the objects in the ancient Mediterranean collection. As it has developed since, this project will bring together senior scholars from around the country, as well as students from Rice University and the University of Houston Clear Lake to research the objects. Via a conference, a website, and a print publication, those results will be made available to the public. We are also looking ahead to a future re reinstallation of the galleries informed by this research. This level of partnership between a museum and academic institutions in object and provenance research is unusual and we hope the project will establish a model for similar work elsewhere. This project has various pedagogical and museological goals, but also clear ideological and ethical interests. We aim to research the provenance of these objects, but also to use contextual information to bring meaning to the pieces, despite their lack of provenience. Today, I will present my initial research into this beloved but problematic object. The goal of my research has been to find meaning in it, despite its lack of archaeological context, but while still acknowledging that absence and the problems it engenders. The figure also has a modern history that must be acknowledged and which I believe can be a locus of meaning for the object. Today, I will present some initial research and reflections on the piece, which will give you a sense of the direction in which my work and the larger work of our research collaborative is going. The piece in question is a Sumerian sculpture of a man. It is titled Votive Statue of Aonitum, Prince of Lagash. Made of a gypsiferous white stone, it stands 30.5 centimeters high. The piece was researched and described by Pierre Amier for the Manil's 1987 catalog. It is one of the iconic objects in the antiquities collection. The sculpture portrays a male figure standing on a shallow base. His hands are clasped at chest height. 
His torso is bare, with nipples inlaid in blue lapis lazuli. He wears a textured skirt known as a kaunakis. Particular to this period, the garment is a sheepskin, as evidenced by the texture. There is often a tail-like tassel on the back. On this example, the tassel is just off-center. This particular example of a kaunakis is notable for the detail and high relief of the texture. The skirt falls to about knee length. The figure is bald and beardless. The face is sensitively modeled with a prominent nose with details such as the nostrils carefully carved. The mouth has a slight smile with lips drawn back and cheeks full. The eyes are large with inlaid materials accentuating them and inlay also in the prominent brow. The ears are carefully shaped. The shoulders and elbows form strong angles, the geometric forms of the upper body countering and balancing the conical shape of the skirt. The heavy straight legs and large feet were evidently not structurally sound enough to support the piece, and a metal pin was inserted, most likely in antiquity, to strengthen and support the piece. An inscription in Sumerian cuneiform is incised on the figure's back. It is translated as Aonatum, Prince of Lagash, Son of Akurgal. Sculpture such as this became common in southern Mesopotamia in the third millennium BC. There are 550 similar examples. The third millennium in southern Mesopotamia is known to scholars as the early dynastic period, so-called because this is the first moment from which we have records showing dynastic kingship in Mesopotamia. This period is one evidently marked by shifts in power and the gradual rise of what has been called a more charismatic form of kingship. In that context, inscribed royal statuary became gradually more common. The inscriptions provide a partial record of dynastic history in the third millennium. Statues such as these, when their context is known, come almost exclusively from temple contexts. They are usually understood as votives. Like a votive candle in a church today, they would serve both as offerings to a god as well as physical manifestations of the devotion and prayer of an individual. That we today understand them in this way, as representing individuals, reflects the way we write the past. Our modern esteem for the individual shapes our interpretation of works such as these. In their eyes, we recognize our own urge to see. In their individuality and earnest attention, we recognize our urge to be seen, to be recognized. Thus, we write rather than discover the past. Each new interaction with the material culture of antiquity creates a rewriting of history. It is in that vein that I approach this piece, seeing it as a palimpsest of meanings rather than as a fossil of a single moment in time. In terms of style, the temple statues have long been noted for their abstract style. The geometric forms of the cylindrical limbs, cone-like skirt, and triangular shoulders have been interpreted in any number of ways from primitive to modern. Following the usual paradigms of art history, a chronological development from abstract to naturalistic was assumed. However, such a development is not corroborated by archaeology. When we let go of the old paradigm that the development of ancient art was on an ineluctable path towards naturalism, we can address the abstraction more freely. Abstraction emphasizes certain features and forms while de-emphasizing others. In temple statuary such as the Aonatum figure, we find an emphasis on the wide staring eyes, the static body, and the gesture that we associate with the modern gesture of prayer. In her recent study of the corpus of statuary, 
Evans suggests that abstraction in minimizing resemblance to an actual subject would have distanced the statue from the donor, allowing the statue to become more strongly connected to its intended temple context. Therein, we find a correction to our modern view of the importance of the representation of the individual. Arguably, the early dynastic was a period during which power and elite identity coalesced in Mesopotamia, resulting in a certain uniformity in visual culture. However, there was certainly still variety, both over time and from region to region. We find differences in style among the sculpture that may reflect that variety. We also find the reworking and reusing of sculpture, practices that suggest a single statue could have played multiple roles in antiquity. In the case of the Manil piece, Amiers suggested in his 1987 essay that it was an example of such reuse. Amiers notes that the freestanding legs are characteristic of examples from the early part of the early dynastic period, such as a hoard found in a secure archeological context at Tel Asmar. The elaborated pattern of the Kaunaki skirt on the Manil figure, however, is typical of later examples, he notes. Furthermore, Aonatum's dynasty was later in the early dynastic period than the Asmar Horde. Amiers solves this chronological puzzle by suggesting that the original statue may have been reused by Aonatum, who had the inscription added. The repair with a metal rod whose composition matches metals used in the third millennium BC could be further evidence of reuse. Aonatum, whose name appears on the Manil figure, was ruler of the city-state of Lagash around 2450 BC. Aonatum is most famous as the king who commissioned the famous Stela of the Vultures today in the Louvre collection. It includes a long inscription relating the conflict between Aonatum's Lagash and the neighboring city, Uma. His name and deeds are thus relatively well known compared to the often murky history of the third millennium BC. Returning to the chronological questions that have been raised about the Manil sculpture, we find that stylistic comparisons do not yield chronological clarity. Recalling that the legs of the Manil piece, compared to the Tel Asmar hoard, were thought to give the piece an early date, we can indeed see similarities there. While the legs and the sharp angles of the arms are similar, the treatment of the faces is quite different, with the Manil example far more naturalistically modeled and hyper-expressive. The proportions are also quite differently conceived. However, there are later examples of dedicatory statues with freestanding legs, such as this early dynastic, late early dynastic, early Akkadian piece from Mari. It is likely that we cannot rely on this feature as a chronological indicator. Other examples from the city-state of Mari, up the Euphrates from southern Mesopotamia, present further strong comparisons for the Manil piece with features such as expressive modeled faces, inlaid eyes and eyebrows, and freestanding feet. We needn't therefore use stylistic traits to show complex reuse in antiquity. The metal rod, however, does suggest repair and perhaps a long lifespan for the piece. What about the inscription? Amiers suggests that it was added by Aonatum to an earlier work. However, according to scholars specializing in the epigraphy of the period, the inscription on the Manil piece is probably a modern addition. As Marchesi and Marchetti explain, the forms of the signs resemble the cuneiform used on clay, rather than the inscriptions incised on stone. I think to this audience, I need not explain that wedge-shaped signs would be found on clay, not stone, 
as seen here. Another modern addition made before the Manil acquired the piece is the black material in the eyes. So questions remain. Is the piece actually from Mari? Is the metal repair ancient? Was the inscription indeed added by a modern forger attempting to add market value to the piece? These questions can't be answered definitively because of the loss of archaeological context that is inevitable with a piece that has been looted and then put on the art market. Along with the immeasurable destruction such looting causes to an archaeological site, there is this resulting uncertainty about an object's authenticity. And this brings me back to the question that inspired my investigation. Given these issues, what do we do with an object such as this? Hide it in a storeroom? Put it on display with a vague label? Use stylistic comparisons to give it a likely provenience? Doing so would blur its questionable modern history, add to its market value, and thus contribute to the problem of looting and the art market. I propose that there is much to be said of interest about the modern history of this object. Adding a king's name to a piece to raise its value reflects our modern relationship to objects and tells a story about how we value things. Things associated with named individuals matter to us, but the majority of Sumerian temple sculpture lacked inscriptions and were presumably donated by non-royal people. Nameless, with abstract, non-mimetic features, they represent a donor, but also a larger impulse, that of a city's population to honor a deity. The meaning of the piece has shifted it now serves to connect us with a history that is largely lost to us. We put the name of a rare known king on it. We look into its eyes and try to see the thoughts and hopes and prayers of that king. The object can't be unlooted. It can't be uninscribed. But it continues to have meaning and we can continue to value its story. To do so ethically, I argue, requires the transparency that the Manil Collection is offering through its collaborative research with academic institutions. By telling stories such as this one via our project's website, we can shed light on this collection's history, both ancient and modern. Our site will launch in January 2017 when students and scholars will begin their research. I hope to share an update with you at a future meeting. Thank you.